turn to John's Gospel, chapter 2. We're going to begin reading in verse 23. We're so blessed to have so many great singers, musicians in our church, and we appreciate that ministry each and every week. Uh, we're going to be looking at John, chapter 2. I'll begin reading in verse uh, 23 in just a moment. Um, Karen and I, we have a king-size bed in our main bedroom, and uh, actually it's uh, two single beds with uh, single boxes and a king-size mattress. The way the single beds are designed, it allows you to, to make it into a king-size bed. I love that thing, although it takes a lot of room in it. And I think the reason I liked it, I grew up sharing a room with my big brother, and even when I was in high school, I slept in a twin bed in the same room with my brother when he would come home from college. And uh, so I enjoy that king size bed. We received it about 30 years ago. My mom got it used uh, from uh, a family member. My mom did estate sales, and so everybody knew that. And this was one of her distant cousins that talked with her because their parents were going into a nursing home facility and their names were Thurley and Gilmer. I've never heard of anybody named Thurley before. So sometimes when I'm joking around with Karen, I'll just yell in the house, Thurley, and she'll know exactly um, what I mean. But that bed is really a nice bed and Thurley and Gilmer, Thurley was the lady, Gilmer the man, they kept it in great shape um, and everything was great with that bed until I tried to assemble it in my haste. And you know where I'm going with this. I tried to rush doing it. I dropped the footboard, it fell, and I wish it could have just made a straight break, but it splintered, enter the man who did all of my mom's work, Mr. Parsons, and he is a master at restoring furniture. But in spite of that, if you were to go into our bedroom, uh, you would easily, if you inspected, see where he did the repair work. And I'll just put it this way, as good a work as Mr. Parsons did in his life, I don't think I would be leaning or pressing on that particular post. You know, as I think about our lives, we were created in great quality. We were created in the image of God. In fact, at the conclusion of the day, after man was created, God looked at everything and said, it's very good. But then sin entered the world. And sin snapped that fellowship that we had with God. And sin took us as beings created in the image of God. And while we still are in that image, we see that that image was affected by sin and their limitations that come with our humanness. We fall short in our motives, in our actions, and in our understanding. And today in John chapter 2 and on into John chapter 3, I want to look at these sin-generated limitations, but before we close, we most certainly want to look at God's answer for that. Look with me at John chapter 2 and verse 23. While Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many trusted in his name when they saw the signs he was doing. Jesus, however, would not entrust himself to them since he knew them all and because he did not need anyone to testify about man, for he himself knew what was in man. There was a man from the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one could perform these signs you do unless God were with him. Jesus replied, I assure you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. But how could anyone be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked him. Can he enter his womb, his mother's womb, rather, a second time and be born? Jesus answered, I assure you, unless someone is born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh, and whatever is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I told you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it pleases. You hear its sound. You don't know where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. Are you a teacher of Israel and don't know these things? Jesus replied, I assure you, we speak what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but you do not accept our testimony. 
If I've told you, if I have told you about things that happen on earth and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you about the things of heaven? Let's pray. Father, as we look at your word today, we thank you that in your love toward us, that you reached down to us in grace through Jesus Christ. Father, we are sinful, broken people. Apart from you, dead spiritually, but Lord, by your grace and your initiative, we thank you for the restoration and the new life that comes through Jesus Christ. Father, if there be any here today who have not trusted in Jesus, I pray, Lord, this day, your spirit would convict and convince that, Father, they might be born again. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, our text this morning includes really what is probably the most famous dialogue, certainly in all the Gospels and arguably in all of Scripture, as Jesus is carrying on this discussion with Nicodemus, a Pharisee who came to Jesus at night. Now, we might wonder why he came at night. Maybe he wanted to come to him discreetly. Maybe uh, both of them were busy during the day and it happened to be at night. We don't want to read too much into it. However, we know that this Pharisee came inquiring of Jesus. And we won't get to it this week, but next week we're going to look at John 3.16, which is actually the most famous verse in all of Scripture. I thought it to be so. I decided I would look online and every resource, every uh, survey group, every entity said John 3.16 is the most recognized verse in all of Scripture. And so as we look at it more in depth next week, we're going to see God's grace to us. And we need God's grace. We need the forgiveness that comes through Christ because we are fallible individuals. We sin. We fall short. And so next week, we're going to look at John 3, 16 in depth and God's answer for sin. And so we see the answer. But this week, we need to see the problem that we're broken, that we fall short. And, and we're going to look at the question today, what's in a person? And when we look in depth, we're going to see it's really not that pretty. And in these 15 verses are going to sort set the stage for what we're going to look at more in depth next week. So we might say that today we have both bad news and good news. And we're going to hit the bad news first. I was reading this week, I think 78% of people would rather hear the bad news first and get it out of the way and then the good news. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to look at the bad news of our situation. And then the good news of God acting toward that. And the first thing I want you to know is the bad news. And it is this, that which is in a person is not good. I had a friend a number of years ago who pastored in the area, and he had a great sense of humor. We were talking one day, and he was uh, going in view of a call to two different churches. He had to preach at both churches. It was a two-church field. And so he was sharing with me and my my buddy Bruce Larson, we were listening to the story and our friend said, I I preached both and my wife went with me. And after I preached both messages, I asked my wife, how did I do? She said, well, the first message I thought was the worst message I've ever heard in my life until I heard you preach it the second time. (laughs) So I thought with a wife like that, she called it like it was, I guess. You know, God created us in his image, but we're not all that. We fall short. We have intrinsic value, but we miss the mark as hard as we might try. And you may try. And this man was a Pharisee to whom Jesus was talking. As hard as we may try, we fall short. If not in in word, in action. If not in word and action, in thought, we're sinners. And we have to teach a child what? How to do what is right, not how to do what is wrong. We have this propensity, this bent toward evil. But remember, we're heading toward the good news. But in order for the good news to be appreciated as the good news it is, we must first understand the bad news. And first, as we look at our sinfulness, we see that we're, as humans, we waver in spirit. In our very best days... 
we're unreliable. Two weeks ago, we read of Jesus' great miracle of transformation, transforming the water into wine. Last week, we looked at Jesus' amazing teaching and how he refuted the religious leaders and how he prophesied. We know this side of the cross and the resurrection rightly that he would be crucified and that he rose again. And so immediately as we move from last week to this week, we see that while he was still in Jerusalem, verse 23, at the Passover festival, many people trusted in his name when they saw the signs. So you would think Jesus would be amazed at that. He himself would be caught up in the euphoria of it. Yet instead of embracing, we see in verse 24, Jesus, however, would not entrust himself to them since he knew them all. In other words, uh, as we look at Jesus' ministry here, the crowds were enthralled. They were ready to follow him wherever they were ready to believe, but he wasn't impressed why, by that. Why is that? Because he knows how we as humans can be. We're emotional. Many times we can be driven by our emotions rather than by our will. And Jesus understood it, said he understood all of them. And he realized, and he, and he found out, obviously, later it was manifest uh, during Holy Week that those who were rejoicing on Sunday were really nowhere to be found on Friday. And such was the case here very early in his ministry that he understood our frailty. He understood how we can go from being very high to being down. And, and if his ministry would be dependent on the emotions of people, he could easily be distracted. But he would not. We see a couple of illustrations of our frailty in this area, of our wavering in spirit. One of the most readily evident is Peter when he was with Jesus in that upper room. And Jesus was predicting uh, that he himself would be struck, would be killed, and that they would scatter. Remember, Peter said, I will never, never, twice, it, for emphasis in the Greek, I will not ever deny that I knew you. And within a few short hours, three times, he denied the Lord. Or what about the time when a scribe said in Matthew chapter 8, verse 20, very excited, having seen all of the miracles Jesus did, I'll follow you wherever you go. Jesus said, is that okay? No, Jesus said, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man, Jesus, has no place to lay his head. In other words, Jesus knew that following him was not a matter of the emotion it was a matter of the will. And he understood the people here at the end of John chapter 2. They could easily waver in spirit. And he knew the danger that if he submitted his ministry to the whims of human beings, he would be heading not in obedience to God. Instead, he entrusted himself to the Father. So we see that we can be fickle, that we waver in spirit. But I want you to see, secondly, very simply put, we're just sinful in nature. We see that in the first eight verses of chapter 3. Now, you know, in John 3, we see Nicodemus had a whole lot that was going right for him. Matt Carter lists at least five positive things regarding Nicodemus. He is serious about religion, we see in verse 2. He is morally upright. He's from the Pharisees. The Pharisees were considered to be the highest of the religious group. He was powerful as a religious leader. He's kind and respectful toward Jesus. He doesn't come with baited questions like we see so often and we've seen lately, but he is coming with respect toward Jesus. He was extremely knowledgeable. But all of that was not good enough. It's very interesting that this Pharisee, this man who was of the highest religious group, who was esteemed by people, came to Jesus because he knew he had a need. I wonder today, no matter how you may be outwardly, do you know inwardly, I'm lacking something. 
I need something. It's very interesting. Not only did Nicodemus realize that about himself, that as, as righteous as he might outwardly appear, there was a problem inwardly. Jesus knew it too. Because when he came to Jesus, Jesus didn't say, you're good and good to go. He didn't say that. Why is that? Because in spite of the good qualities, at this point when Nicodemus came to him, he was living physically, he was breathing, but spiritually he was dead. And the Bible says that if a person has not trusted the Lord Jesus Christ unto salvation, even if that person is walking in the workplace, in the city streets, that person is spiritually dead. Remember in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 17, God warned Adam, in the moment you eat from that tree, you will die. Now, he didn't physically drop dead that moment, although it can be argued that physically his mortality set in. He began the process of death, but more than just moving toward physical decline and death, God meant that he was spiritually dead. In fact, in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, it says, related to that, that because of Adam's sin, death spread to all people. Unless the Lord himself comes back first, every one of us will physically die. But more than that, the book of Revelation twice speaks of a second death of eternal separation spiritually from God. So here was Nicodemus, a man in high position, a man who possessed a, we might argue, a good character, a sincere character. But these were not enough, Jesus said, for him to experience the kingdom of God. Why is that? Because he was sinful in nature. Jesus is saying, you're still, act, you're still lacking. Today, if you've never believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, I don't care how many years you've been in church, how many times you have performed this, how many times you have prayed. If you've never believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're separated from God in your sin and you're spiritually dead. But I want you to see a third thing. Humans lack spiritual understanding. <clears throat> Satan is the great deceiver in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 5. He deceived Adam because he said, if you eat from that tree that God told you not to eat from it, you will become as knowledgeable as God. You'll have all of the knowledge of God. That was a lie because he didn't. And compared to God, I like how my uh, roommate calls somebody that's not the brightest person in the world. He says, dumb as a bag of hammers. And I thought he created that, but I've seen other people have said that. But compared to God who has all knowledge, we're ignorant. We do not know. We do not understand. And by our own nature, we cannot understand spiritual things. The things of God are revealed by the Spirit of God. What, what um, knows the things of a man other than the Spirit of a man, the Scripture says, who knows the things of God other than the Spirit of God? Nicodemus here is sincere, but at this point has not been saved. He comes to Jesus and, and he says, can a person enter a mother's womb a second time? He's thinking in the physical realm. He's on the wrong frequency here. Jesus is saying, you must be born again. He's thinking, well, I'm pretty big to go back in my mother's womb and be born again. And Jesus is saying, you really don't understand in verse 9. We see that he still struggles understanding it. He was struggling knowing what the Father was teaching him through Jesus. You know, in Mark chapter 3 and 4, Jesus tells a long parable, the parable of the sower, which might also be called the parable of the soils, the four different types of soil. It's one of the longer parables because the parable itself is long. And then when Jesus interprets the parable, he spends a lot of words in doing that. But after that, we see that after hearing it, the disciples were in his company. And Jesus said this of the crowds. He said, seeing 
they don't see and hearing they don't hear lest they see and hear and believe. In other words, the hardness of their natural hearts were keeping individuals from knowing what he was teaching. You cannot know the things of God in human terms. They're spiritually taught. And so there were many times we see that people were hearing things and they went away befuddled. Here we see twice that at this point in his life, Nicodemus is confused. And it's so important for us to know this. In our lacking, in our wavering spirit, in our sinful nature, in, in our lack of understanding, we are totally dependent upon the grace of God. We can't even begin spiritually, religiously, apart from the grace of God. So we're not all that. In ourselves, every one of us, we're without hope. We're wavering in our will. We're dead in our sin. We're without understanding in and of ourselves the spiritual things. That, that's the bad news, but the good news is this. What we cannot do, Jesus did. He stepped in our place. I've been reading a book I, I purchased this week, and it, it talks about where religions have gone wrong, and it lists the five things about it. And this guy was trained in um, Baptist seminaries, but he's way too liberal. I don't agree with him on a lot of stuff, but I read it to know how I can argue uh, ag against it. And he began to criticize all types of religions and compare all the religions alike. And I thought, you know what? You're dead wrong. I don't care how many degrees you have because Jesus is Lord. He alone is Lord. And there's no way where you can say, well, Jesus did wrong here. Jesus did wrong there. No, listen, Jesus is the foundation of our faith. Know him. How do you know him? Through scripture, the spirit revealing who he is to you. You see, God understands our state. He knows that we are dust. That's what Psalm 103, 14 says. Even as a parent knows a child and parents, you know your children. That's why it's real easy when other people try to discipline a child. I almost laugh because I say that parent knows that child a lot better, you know, and, and, and we know our children. We know our children. God knows us and he loves us. And he didn't leave us to wander in our wretched state. He sent Jesus. And I want to look at three things very quickly. First, Jesus did not waver. We may waver, but he did not. What does it say here at the end of chapter 2? He said that he didn't entrust himself to people who were wavering because he wasn't going to be caught in what people thought of him. He trusted himself to the Father's will. He did not need man's testimony, which would be up and down. He did need the Father's plan. He entrusted himself totally to the Father, and he totally fulfilled what he himself predicted would happen. In Mark chapter 10 and verse 45, it says, For the Son of Man, Jesus speaking of himself, came not to be served, but to serve, and to do what? To give his life as a ransom for many. We may waver, but Jesus didn't waver. He went all the way to Calvary to die for your sin. He didn't waver. Secondly, he was without sin. There was no sin found out in, in him. Outwardly, Nicodemus may have seemed to have been righteous, but even in Nicodemus being, he understood something was lacking. People may judge us outwardly one way, but do they know us inwardly? But inside and out, Jesus was perfect. And Jesus sees the heart. Nicodemus needed an inward cleansing of the spirit. John 3, he still lacked something, but not Jesus. He was without sin. Nicodemus may not have understood all that Jesus is saying here, but I will say this, he came to the right one. But then a third thing, the spirit of God through Jesus' work gives both understanding and life. Look at verse 3. Jesus replied, here's Nicodemus lifting up Jesus, 
I know, Rabbi, you're great. You couldn't do this by your own authority. There's an authority high. But again, Jesus wasn't influenced by someone who at this point was spiritually dead. He cut to the quick. I assure you, unless someone is born again, they'll not see the kingdom of God. In a state of spiritual death, that person needs one thing, not another outward act, but an inward transformation, a cleansing of the spiritual life. Notice what he says in verse 5. Uh, Jesus said, I assure you, unless someone is born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Verse 6, whatever is born of the flesh is flesh, and whatever is born of the spirit is spirit. These two verses can be complicated. People have various interpretations. I tend to believe that being born of the water is physical birth, because in verse 6, it talks about being born of the flesh, physical birth, and spiritual birth. Some people would say baptism, but baptism is not efficacious towards salvation. But my understanding as I look at this is this. What you need is the spiritual birth. There are people today that are walking on this earth who are spiritually dead. They must be born from above, must be born again. And guess what? That life comes from God. You know, the beauty of it is we don't have to understand all of it. We want to we want to under we want to know everything, don't we? I like what Jesus said. Don't be amazed. I told you you must be born again. The wind blows where it pleases. You hear it sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. He's saying here, you don't have to give a doctrinal dissertation, a 50-page paper, a 150-page paper on what it means to be born again. You can still experience it. You can begin to grasp and understand what it is, but you'll never fully understand the grace of God. It is so great that our finite minds cannot begin to understand it, but we can experience it. What is born of flesh is of the flesh, but what is born of the spirit is spirit. Have you experienced the spiritual birth? Now, again, we're talking about a real thing, and it's really in this. Hearing the gospel and being convinced Jesus is Lord. I'm a sinner. I need you. Don't don't be confused. Like like verse 8 says, you don't have to understand everything. But if you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ unto salvation, the scripture says, and we're going to see next week you're saved. Simply put, though, without being born again, you won't be a part of the kingdom of God. You'll be a part of the human race. You're you're physically born. But apart from the spiritual birth, you won't be adopted into the family of God. And if that doesn't change... You'll spend eternity separated from God. Now, the good news for Nicodemus is he gives evidence that he got it. I was looking at all four Gospels, and the only Gospel to include this fact was John, because John, I believe, considered it pertinent because he recorded chapter 3, and it was this. Nicodemus was there with Joseph of Arimathea after Jesus' death, and he was part of those two that prepared Jesus' body for burial. Now think about that. All of the religious leaders, what were they concerned? They were concerned the disciples were going to steal the body. They were watching vigilantly. If there was ever a time when the religious leaders would have watched what happened to Jesus, it would have been at that time. And where was Nicodemus? I'm here with him. I'm here with him. He came to Jesus wavering in the grasp of sin. And without understanding, but by the grace of God, he found hope through Jesus Christ. I wonder today, what about you? Have you believed on him? I'm not asking, are you trying to be a good person? Hey, Nicodemus was good. I'm not trying to say, are you a leader? And Nicodemus was a leader. What I'm saying today is, have you come to the place in your life where you know, God, I'm a sinner and I need Jesus Christ? to save me from my sin and make me anew within. If you've never done that, 
We want to give you the opportunity to do that. I'm going to close in prayer, and then as part of that prayer, I'll voice a prayer on your behalf. Now, if you've trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ in the past, you don't need to repeat that prayer again. God has saved you. You need to continue to grow in him. But if you've never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, when I move to that portion of prayer, you can join with me. But let's pray. Father, we thank you for all of the narratives in Scripture. We thank you for the book of John. We thank you for this dialogue with Nicodemus. And Lord, as we look today at the Scripture, Jesus, you said, we must be born again. Father, there's some here today. They may not understand all about it, but they know there's a void in their lives. And Jesus is the answer. And Father, as I pray, they may pray this prayer today. Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that my sins grieve you no matter how I look on the outside. Lord, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sinful in my person. I need Jesus Christ in my life the unwavering son of God, sinless, the perfect sacrifice. I believe in him. And Lord, I confess him today. Lord, forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me of it. Give me the new life, the spiritual birth. Father, there are individuals today who prayed that for the very first time. I pray you would seal that decision in their heart. But Lord, your word also says we know that if we confess you before men, you'll confess us before the Father in heaven. And that, Lord, we believe in the heart, Romans tells us, but we confess with the mouth unto salvation. I pray that if anyone prayed that prayer today, Lord, that you would convince them of how important it is to identify with you publicly, to let people know. I'm a follower of Jesus. Father, we just lift this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know how God may have spoken today. We want to give you an opportunity. If you today prayed to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we want you to come forward today and share that decision.